PR Law is an international law firm of about 300 or so attorneys around the world, um, including jurisdictions that are, are pretty vital for the blockchain industry, meaning Singapore, uh, the UK, Switzerland, uh, and of course the US, among other places. Uh, my name is Alexandra Levin Kramer. I'm a partner at CKR Law and also the founding chair of its blockchain technology and digital currency practice group. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce to you really expert uh, panelists on a topic that, well, several topics actually that are really vital uh, for those of us who hold uh, crypto portfolios or are interested in it or are wondering what happens uh, at our demise among other things. So with that, let me just quickly introduce everyone. Um, to my right is Brian Christensen, a CPA and partner at Freeman LLP. Uh, to his right is Christopher Williams, tax director at Citroen Cooperman. Uh, to his right is Eli, uh, Eli Akavan, excuse me, a partner at CKR Law, where he's chair of the Private Client and Wealth Preservation Group. And to his right is Susan Katz, um, wealth management advisor, and portfolio manager at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. And with that, Eli, I'll let you start. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief three to five minute overview of the tax, estate, and financial planning issues that come with cryptocurrency ownership. Uh, after that, we're going to have a panel, a sort of Q&A on the topics that I outlined, but to do a little bit of a deeper dive on it, and then of course we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have my PowerPoint on me. Uh, somebody was supposed to bring it with a laptop, and I did not bring the backup, which in Bitcoin is something you always need with cryptocurrency backups. Uh, so that's the first lesson. Uh, the <laughs> exactly, exactly, thank you. So uh, we all know we just went through um, the tax reform. Uh, there are a few elements of tax reform that really affect cryptocurrency owners. Uh, the first issue has to do with like-kind exchanges. Uh, as of 2018, uh, Bitcoin exchanges will not qualify for like-kind, which raises the question, as to transactions that happened in 2017, whether those qualify for like-kind treatment or non-recognition treatment. That's something we're, we're going to touch upon. Uh, another issue with Bitcoin, and this has to do with estate planning, is that the estate tax exemption and gift tax exemption has doubled to around $11.2 million per individual, and that's just going to rise until the end of 2025, 2026, the exemption levels are going to be going back to what they were. Uh, that gives a terrific uh, opportunity for large cryptocurrency owners to, or cryptocurrency owners that have large holdings to uh, transfer assets while uh, they're at still you know, at high value. And you know, we've all heard different valuations. I've heard Bitcoin's gonna go to 100,000, you know, hold on for dear life. Uh, but it, it, you know, whatever your analysis is for your clients, or if you are the client, uh, it's something to consider. Uh, that's, that's two items, and we're also going to be, disc and that's with, the, with respect to the tax reform. Uh, we're going to touch upon a little bit of the coin base, the coin desk summons um, against uh, that the IRS introduced. Uh, the coin desk summons essentially is the IRS's tool that they went after a large exchange to get the identity of taxpayers uh, that had, you know, coin, that had uh, Bitcoin holdings. Um, it's important to note that um, the market cap right now for virtual currency is estimated to be anywhere from 300 billion to 500 billion dollars. You see it all over the media, it's the hottest topic now. This will draw increased IRS scrutiny. It's not even a question, it's not a matter of uh, if. It's going to happen, it already has happened, and the question is how to advise our clients to come into compliance with their, uh, you know, their tax obligations. Another issue, uh, aside from income tax reporting uh, of, Bitcoin, of virtual currency, is the issue of foreign, uh, uh, virtual currency that's held you know, in, on foreign exchanges. Do you have to file an FBAR or FinCEN Form 114 to report these foreign-held 
of uh, virtual currencies. I mean, these are all things that you should be raising with your cryptocurrency clients. And again, we're going to take a deeper dive into this uh, uh, you know, very shortly. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the backup. Uh, it's very important that your clients have an estate planning mechanism and structure set up for their cryptocurrency holding. It's not just for tax planning. It's much more practical than that. If they don't have a plan set up, they could lose an immense amount of wealth. Uh, them and their heirs, their, their spouse, their, their children, or their intended beneficiaries. And we're gonna be discussing what sort of mechanisms there are to help your clients to make sure that you know, uh, tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of wealth is not lost because there was no uh, proper planning done for them. Thank you, and then we look forward. Thank you. Um, can I just have a quick survey of hands here? Uh, who has never heard of blockchain or virtual currencies? Awesome. Okay. Who here holds a portfolio of Bitcoin, Ether, or any other virtual currency? Okay. So I think for, for the rest of the... Uh, uh, the event today, we need to be mindful that we have some portfolio holders here for whom I assume you haven't filed your tax return yet. You may not have included anything in your will with passwords, etc. You may not have considered how to diversify your wealth that may have accumulated over the, the past year. So um, being mindful of that, why don't we get started? Um, Brian, can I ask you, um, what would you say are some of the biggest tax pitfalls um, that taxpayers are, taxpayers are facing or will be facing in the coming year? Uh, sure. So I think the biggest pitfall for people is actually not reporting uh, anything. So I know that goes without saying, but the reason people aren't reporting is for a couple of reasons. Um, so far what I'm hearing is, number one, they don't know what to report because they're getting a lot of bad information. Um, if you Google how do I report this, how do I do this, there's 12 different ways you do the same thing. Um, some of those people are in the space, they know what they're doing, and some of them are just doing what blockchain tea company did, and they're putting crypto blockchain on their uh, credentials. Um, and then the other group are people who actually, they want to report, they just don't know how. So the complexity of calculating what are my gains and losses when I take fiat and I buy Bitcoin, I transfer it to Poloniex, and I buy this token, that token, back to Bitcoin, back to cash, like I don't know how to calculate that gain. And they don't want to do 10,000 lines on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so there's like, well, I just won't do it. Um, and then some people believe that if it's on a foreign exchange, they'll never catch me, which uh, I think that's bad. But I think the not reporting is the biggest tax pitfall I'm seeing so far. Um, so the advice is just make sure that wherever you're getting your advice from is you make sure they know what they're talking about. Um, you know, the 1031 exchange, I guess we'll talk about that later. Um, we all have our opinions on that, but um, I, my opinion is I don't believe 1031 has ever applied to cryptocurrency. Um, I've never seen it happen. So if anybody is reporting that, um, I would not allow someone to do that. So. Thank you. Um, Christopher, what are you seeing from clients with regards to filing obligations related to, um, let's say, trading of cryptocurrencies or token sales, mining, receipt for services, uh, in particular where there are members <coughs> of the audience who are getting compensated in a cryptocurrency? So yes, I, I, I have a client right now that I'm working through going back from 2014 to current, trying to understand what he has done over the past three and a half years. He's received cryptocurrency in exchange for services. He's bought cryptocurrency with fiat. He didn't know the level of reporting that was required with his tax reporting. So we have to go back to 2014 and refile um, tax returns to report income. Uh, for 14, we can't report a loss to get a refund because it's too far laid out of the statute of limitations, but we can report the income and, and pay the, pay the uh, underreported tax liability. Over the weekend, this client also sent me, forwarded me an email from Coinbase which basically said that he is being flagged as a potential, his account's gonna be flagged and reported to the IRS for 2014, 15, and 16. So he forwarded that along, he says, can we have a chat? So we had a chat, we spoke for about three hours on, on Saturday and we've, we've come up with a game plan. So we've had to go back to all of his exchanges, 
pull all of his reporting, CSV files, everything, and just start combing through the information. And he doesn't understand where he got some of the coins or what some of these transactions are, or where some of these Bitcoins went with this wallet ID. He's like, I, I have no idea what this wallet ID is or where it went or who it is. So I can't tell you what that transaction is for. So we have to come up with a game plan. So it's going back that many years can be very, very hard to <laughs> figure out what you did do. But if you did go back that, if you do have transactions going back that far, now is the time to start figuring it out and understanding your, tra your transactions. Because if, again, with the Coinbase John Doe summons, you, if you had $20,000 or more in transactions through Coinbase, you are gonna get reported to the IRS through, what they're gonna be filing is the 1099K, which is the gross proceeds, which they, it's another form that's used by merchants to report gross proceeds on sales. So that's what taxpayers are gonna receive. Now they're gonna get this form and not know what to do with it and not know how to tie in their proceeds that they've re that they're on that exchange to what they've done, and I think that's going to be a, the number one uh, item is just going back in time and just trying to piece everything together. And it can be really, really hard for some of these younger individuals that have never had to keep track of anything for that long. So, Brian, I mean, sort of the same question: What would you say are the, the toughest obstacles that um, individual taxpayers will face in the upcoming tax filing season? So again, it's, it's how you calculate all those gains. And, and again, to go to the, the 1099K that Coinbase is going to be issuing, they're actually not going to give that blanketly to everyone. Uh, they said they're going to give it specifically to people they think are in the business uh, of doing this. Only select people are going to do that. Um, and we've had clients that are exchanges, and we're trying to figure out how can we report things to people. Um, so we can't even figure out the information that should be reported to the taxpayer. So they're not going to even know what information they're supposed to be reporting. Um, so, I, and I think another uh, problem that people have is things like a fork, an airdrop, they don't know what these things are or they don't know how they're taxed. They don't even know that they happen. So they may at some point get information, hey, you just received some tokens and that's a taxable event. And then they don't report that. So not knowing, and even if you do know how you report that, I think that's gonna be a big obstacle for people. Um, so that's what we're, we're working through. So um, we mentioned earlier, um, some of us may hold uh, coins on a foreign exchange. Um, could you talk a bit, um, Christopher, on whether those individuals will actually be required to file you know, the FinCEN 114 or Form 8938? That's a challenging question uh, because FinCEN has come out and said that you know, trading cryptocurrencies is not a reportable event. But are you holding, in the normal FinCEN world, when you have a typical hedge fund or a trader that has a foreign financial account overseas, trading account, securities account, you file the FBAR or the FinCEN 114 to report the value of the account. <coughs> With this, it's, the, the cryptocurrency is, is property, so are, are you really holding a foreign financial asset for FinCEN purposes? And I think we need more information right now, and, Without that information, if your taxpayer is willing enough, I would advise them to actually file the FinCEN 114. What's the hurt in filing the form if you have nothing to hide, per se? And to file the 8938 with the IRS if you're, if you're compliant. I know a lot of people are like, well, hold off. I don't want to report anything to the I want to report least amount as possible. But I think with this uncertainty of tax regulations that are probably with cryptocurrency, which are not going to come for a while, due to the tax legislation because they're crazy about writing those regulations right now. I think uh, to err on this, the safe side of caution, if you have a large uh, account overseas, it would be worth looking into with your advisor, your legal team, and your accountant to talk to them about the considerations of filing the form, what's the benefits and what's the, um, the, the pros and cons with, with filing it. But I, I do have one another. I have another client that does have a large foreign financial asset base in cryptocurrency on a foreign exchange, and I spoke to him about this issue, and he's consider considering reporting it because he has been reporting everything in the past with regards to the gains and losses. So, thank you. Um, and what do you think is going to happen? Um, well, are 1031 exchanges possible with cryptocurrency? I, I agree. I think <laughs> I think it would be really really hard to prove. 1031 exchange 
and taxpayers that have taken this approach to ten thirty one exchange have not filed the correct forms on their tax return to begin with with the identification issue with ten thirty one and the reporting i don't remember the form number off the top of my head but they haven't done it so without reporting it you don't have a qualified like kind of exchange anyway so i don't think taxpayers have underreported tax liabilities to begin with so if 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 i may just on the ten thirty one point and um i'm not saying that it definitely will work but it's something if you had large exchanges done and you want to qualify that for non-recognition treatment it's something to you know sit down with your accountant and your attorney to discuss <laughs> Uh, you may be able to take a position respectfully. I think there could be a position. I have not come out clearly either definitely yes or definitely no. But looking into it, you may have a position. Uh, for prior years, if you haven't done the reporting, I mean, it's over. But for 2017, if there were exchanges done and you would like to look into whether or not it should qualify for non-recognition treatment, we should have a talk. We should discuss that there may be a possible way to do it. Definitely, you should disclose it on your 20, uh, you know, in the tax return you're about to file that you know you're, you're, you're qualifying certain transactions. Um, you know, if you have a well-reasoned opinion backing it up, uh, you know, if, in the, if the IRS does not allow the deferral or the non-recognition treatment, you may be able to get out of penalties. There may be an interest um, and taxes owed at the end of the day, but you may have a position. That's that's my uh, approach to it. Can I just yeah, say one thing? And the, the reason why I don't think it works is because, again, I think people are trying to use it if I just, you know, go into Poloniex or wherever your exchange you're using and just exchange it. Okay, so that clearly doesn't work. So if you were to do it, so if we take real estate, we sold this building, you know, that money goes to a, a qualified intermediary. We have a whole legal team. There's a stack of paper. So fine, if you go through all that transaction and you do all the documentation, maybe. But then you have to think, are they actually like kind? And I think that's where people's opinions differ, right? Why do we have forks? Because the code is different. We want it different. So are, they, are you lumping them all together? Is a token Bitcoin the same? You know, one's security, one's not. I mean, I just don't think it's a good idea to do it because the, po the point is what? Deferral of gain. And that's just going to make the, the IRS mad. And then they just came out with tax reform and they, you know, clarify their position. It's only real property. So if it's that much of a opinion, uh, that much leeway, you really got to have a really good legal team and really button it up because if they come after you, um, did you understate it by a, a large amount? Is it fraud? Like it, it's, it's just not worth it for a lot of those. But again, have a legal team, have an opinion letter, do all of that if you want to do it. Brian, how has the tax reform actually affected um, token buyers or blockchain companies in your opinion? So the, the, well, the biggest thing for us is, you know, we work with a lot of companies uh, and we're doing like international structuring. So that into itself uh, has come not to a screeching, screeching halt, but it's completely changed the way that we um, are doing international structuring for uh, token offerings, ICOs, however we want to see it. Um, but even in the, the U.S., the strategies that we were using for um, ICO companies, uh, simple things have now gone away. The carry back of the NOL, uh, that hurt us a lot. Because what we were saying is, you know, if you're going to have a three-year burn on your cash, so I raised $30 million, I spend it 10, 10, 10, then I pay my tax, I can carry back those NOLs in the future years, so over my three-year period, I'm at a zero. Now we can't do that anymore, so we lose that strategy, so we have to come up with other things like that. Um, so a as an investor, you have to know that these companies don't have these tax savings, they don't have these tax plan opportunities anymore. So they're going to be sending a lot more money to the government. That's a lot less money they have to develop their product and really hone the token. So you're buying something that was going to be spent, $30 million was going to be spent to develop it. Now it's going to be 24, 20, something like that. Awesome. <laughs> OK. Um, great. So why don't we move on, unless there's anything else on tax, I'd like to move into um, wealth management. Yeah. All right. So Suzanne, um, look, clearly 2017 was a good year for many token holders, uh, crypto holders. We do understand that managing wealth comes with certain challenges. And I think um, I think you actually made the comparison to um, sudden wealth that was achieved by certain crypto holders. It's almost like winning the lottery. Um, you just 
are kind of shocked with what's just happened. So could you talk a little bit about um, some financial planning considerations uh, that can help uh, crypto portfolio holders make informed decisions about how to best use their wealth? Sure. Um, so some of the things that, um, as, as I did say, um, when you come into sudden wealth, when you have this cryptocurrency that all of a sudden has exploded in value, um, a lot of people do not realize that there are things that they really need to be thinking about. So um, you can come into sudden wealth in a variety of ways, and there really aren't a lot of differences between coming to wealth through cryptocurrencies or coming to wealth through a large inheritance, through a life insurance, death benefit, through um, company stock that you own that suddenly explodes in value. We all know that lottery winners um, oftentimes within a couple of years or superstar athletes within a couple of years, they just do not have the wealth that they had before. They're not able to maintain their lifestyles. And the thing that you need to remember and that you need to tell your clients who are in this sudden situation is that studies have shown that <coughs> if you were in financial distress prior to receiving large amounts of money, you are only postponing the inevitable because you did not have the time or the counsel to develop good habits around the money that you, that you have. And it is not going to last forever. And people who come into sudden wealth, generally speaking, think that it's just going to be around for all time and that their habits don't need to change. So some of the things that you can do just from a very basic financial planning perspective is counsel your clients to really think about what is important to them in their life. What, is the, what are the goals that they have? What are the priorities? Um, is it health? Is it family? Is it work? Is it leisure? What is, what is it that's meaningful to them? And how is it that they are going to fund these very specific priorities? Taking their cryptocurrency wealth can be a way to, to help achieve this. Um, you want to know precisely how much money it's going to be and how long it's going to take for you to get there. These are very clear, very step-by-step -step things that your clients need to understand that a financial planner can help them with. Um, you want to be sure that your clients have um, some sort of an emergency fund. People don't really think about this and it's very boring. Um, you don't really want to take the potential to earn wealth and put it into something that is really, um, you know, you're just watching paint dry. But you want to be in a position where your clients know that they are set for a specific period of time. If all of their the sudden wealth is ill invested or if something happens to the market, that they're going to be okay and that they have time to, um, to cover their expenses for a period of time that, that is good and that makes sense for them. You want to think about who else knows that they came into this wealth. Who have they told, right? Because they're going to have people coming to them that they would never imagine with um, business questions or you know investments. They're going to have people coming to them with things like, um, I have a very, very good cause. I want you to be on the board of my nonprofit. There are expensive obligations that come with being on the boards of nonprofits. You are going to have people who say, um, you know, they want to fund the education of a relative. They want to sustain a family member. Um, you need to be sure that your client's wealth is tied very carefully to what their own priorities are. You can set aside money for these are the things that are kind of fun. I have a client who just, you know, she took some money and she invested in a Broadway show. It closed very soon after, but you know, you can do that when you know that your basics are covered. And I think that it's really important that people who come into money who did not have money before are very clear about what their very specific path is going to be um, so, that, uh, so that they can take this wealth and maintain it far into the future. And having a really good solid financial plan can help you develop good habits so that you can preserve this money. And I, I think that's really important. So, I mean, as, as we know, uh, those of us who, who were lucky enough to buy certain tokens or, or virtual currencies early have made some money um, in the past year, or at least the value has gone up, uh, give or take. Um, and, you know, clearly the risk is high, but the return has been in some cases pretty high as well. What would you say is really uh, the value in diversification outside of cryptocurrencies, perhaps, where 
you know, people are looking, I mean, not necessarily people in the room, but I have clients who are thinking, well, I, diversification means moving from one coin to another. So um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what are some options av available to those who are a little bit more realistic about the future? Yeah, I think that um, it would be great to say, oh, there are, you know, all of these new and exciting and wonderful ways to diversify. And when it comes down to it, in my opinion, when you are diversifying out of a more risky asset, what you want to do is diversify into something that is a lot more um, established, highly regulated, somewhat more stable, where there's a history of how these things perform over time. Um, I think that people feel like they did really well in this one area, they're just gonna plow more money into it. Or I have this particular type of cryptocurrency and now I'm gonna have another type and that's diversifying. And what we want to be sure is, is that people have a nice wide variety of stocks, bonds, cash and cash equivalents, and that their asset allocation is really matching their time horizon and their risk tolerance. It's very, very basic stuff, but people don't often or always think about it. Um, I think that once people who did not have wealth come into greater wealth, as long as they are um, putting their money into portfolios that are very strongly in alignment with their very specific goals that are meaningful and matter to them, then at, once those basics are covered, they can go and they can invest in other things. But that should really be, in my opinion, something that is on the side. Um, and, so, and so that is a lot of it. You want to be sure that you're developing good habits. You want to be sure that you are um, investing relative to your goals. and. This is really basic stuff, but like, you know, stocks, they are more risky. They are de designed for longer term uh, growth. Bonds, they are less risky. They give you income. Uh, cash and cash equivalents, they are, um, it, it's where you put your much more short term money. These are basic things, but it's important that people think about it. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, all right, now moving on to uh, estate planning. Um, Eli, could you talk a, a bit about um, whether the tax reforms have affected uh, estate and gift tax planning for crypto holders. Sure. So, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the exemption amounts right now are approximately 11.2 million per individual. Uh, it would make sense that if your clients or you have large crypto holdings to shift some of that wealth into uh, vehicles that remove any further appreciation outside of the estate because this 11.2 million uh, exemption per individual is not going to be around forever. It's scheduled to sunset on December 31st, 2025. Uh, and again, with Bitcoin you know, and other virtual currencies, uh, you know, hopefully they're gonna keep on growing and increasing value. Uh, it pays to shift them out of the estate while you have uh, a large exemption rather than do it after 2025 and potentially be subject to uh, gift and estate taxes. Thank you. Um, and and what would you say are other non-tax uh, estate planning issues that crypto holders should be concerned about when bequeathing uh, cryptocurrency assets to their loved ones? Sure. So so for me, honestly, even though my background is tax, I believe that the non-tax issues uh, in transferring this wealth are even more important than the tax issues. And that's because Bitcoin and virtual currencies are not like real estate or tangible personal property that you could lose them one day and then maybe find them another. I mean, I don't know how you lose real estate, but uh, there is, all these things are easily findable. But when you lose access to virtual currency accounts, that's it. The wealth is, is gone. The wealth has uh, disappeared from the family. Uh, there are a few steps that you should be taking when it comes to estate planning for virtual currencies. Uh, step one is under, if you're a New York State resident, New York State and a lot of other states as well, but uh, definitely New York State, uh, they've passed a uh, Digital Assets Fiduciary Act. And that essentially means that your wills should give your executor or your trustee, if you're using a revocable living trust or a regular trust, it should give your fiduciaries the power to access these accounts. Now that's just step one. Uh, and by the way, I would, you know, I've heard uh, suggestions before um, from other attorneys, oh, put in the passwords, put in the addresses in the will. No, do not do that because a will becomes a, 
a public document because it's probated uh, in, in New York State. So you never want that uh, in the actual document itself. Do give your fiduciary access to all digital accounts, make it as broad as possible. Uh, if you do want to preserve some anonymity, maybe you don't want to mention particular exchanges, but uh, you know, we help you draft particular language that allows uh, your fiduciary to gain access. Now, that's just step one. Step two is what's the actual mechanism to transfer assets from uh, you know, your estate or you to your uh, beneficiaries. There are a few strategies. Uh, the first one is copying the wallet. Uh, the second one is M of N transactions because techies have to use calculus in, in, in making uh, estate planning. And then finally, we have the dead man switch. Now, copying the wallet, you're not actually copying and pasting. What you're doing with copying the wallet is giving your intended beneficiary your, the address, the name of the exchange, the private keys. You're giving them all that information. That's one way to do estate planning. Uh, it's not my recommended way because the beneficiary will not only have access after your client's demise or your demise, they'll have access to it as of today. So you really have to trust that beneficiary uh, to do that. You know, it's not my recommended uh, course of action. Uh, second, um, I mean, and you can imagine why, whether it's a, a child who's gonna be you know, wasteful to spending, if it's going to be a spouse and you get divorced. I mean, there's so many issues with that mechanism. The M of N uh, method and technique is to essentially allow three people to be signatories on a specific transaction. So you describe a specific transaction, let's say you know, all the Bitcoins in this account or half the Bitcoins in this account or a certain value, whatever it is, you select a particular transaction. And then you say there are three people that have the authority to transfer this, but you only need two out of three to sign off on it. So who are the two out of the three? The intended beneficiary, the executor slash trustee, the fiduciary, those would be the two that would actually make this transaction happen after your client's death. And the third person obviously is yourself, but like I said, or the client, you only need two out of the three. What's the issue there? Well, first of all, you can only do it for one transaction. So it's either it's all or nothing. Um, uh, you know, you could say, you know, half my Bitcoin, a quarter of my Bitcoins, whatever it is, it's just for that particular transaction. Every time you want to do another transaction, you got to go through the process. The second issue, the primary issue in my mind is, what did I say? You need two out of three, right? So if you have two out of three people and they want to do it during your lifetime, you know, the executor and the beneficiary are in cahoots together, you have an issue. Uh, so not, again, my necessarily recommended way, but it's just something to consider and perhaps there are ways that say only my appointed executor. So that means the executor has to go and uh, get uh, all the letters testamentary from the court, but th that's not necessarily the, uh, you know, the, the best way, but it's something to consider to pass along assets. The final way is called the dead man switch, a very attractive term. But the way you do with the dead man switch is again, you list a particular transaction, the exchange, what happens is they keep on sending out emails. So you better make sure you have your password to your email and you're, you remember your email, and they keep on checking if you're still alive. And if you don't click on that link with a certain amount of time, it will assume you're dead and automatically transfer everything to the beneficiary. So make sure you're checking your emails, make sure that, uh, you know, don't go off the grid. Uh, make sure that, you know, if you don't have capacity, you're alive, but you don't have capacity, there's someone that has a power of attorney for you that can access your emails and can check to make sure that assets don't automatically get transferred. And of course, the, uh, well, like the dead man, like the M of N transactions, this is for specific addresses and for specific accounts. It can't be for all your virtual currency holdings. It can't be for all your Bitcoin holdings. It has to be per account, per address. Uh, and and you know, the, the importance of what we're seeing here is that you really have to have the proper documents to back you up on this. Uh, otherwise, as I said, a lot of wealth, significant wealth will just be lost and there's really no way, uh, currently at least, there's no way to recover it. Uh, in addition to the will, my other recognition I alluded to this is the financial power of attorney make sure that the financial, you have a f properly drafted financial power of attorney because a will is 
only operative for after you pass away. A financial power of attorney is operative while you're alive, but do not have capacity to make financial decisions. And again, you don't want to be in this limbo state where for some reason you know, you're in a coma or your client's in a coma and nobody can have access to these accounts. So make sure these two documents, the will and the financial power of attorney are, you have them. And not only do you have them, they have special language giving access to your fiduciary or to your agent to access your digital accounts. Great, thank you. So I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I'd like to leave some time for questions and answers, but our last question um, to the panel actually is just, in your opinion, how have you felt that the landscape has changed in relation to token sales, blockchain development, and, and what are some thoughts for the future? Anyone? I, I'll take it. Uh, I think um, the ICOs still in full force. I think everybody's still going about their business even more so. I think everyone's just doing it a little bit more cautiously or everyone's just kind of catching up to speed. You know, last year there was a kind of a, a money grab. You know, we were getting calls like I need to do my ICO in the next like literally 30 days or less because I'm going to lose out my chance to get money. And now everyone's like, all right, I'm, my ICO is on hold. We're going to develop the product. Then we're going to go do the ICO. Or, and, and they're really, everyone's looking for regulations. They're looking for guidance. Everybody wants to do the right thing. So they're kind of going about slower and smarter, but I think there's still a lot of smart people doing this, uh, and there's a lot of money still out there. So it's still full force, and it's not slowing down. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that um, prior to the last year, I did not have a single person express any interest in, any knowledge of, any, <clears throat> any understanding of blockchain, cryptocurrency, any of this. <clears throat> and um, and in the last year, interest has just exploded. So in many um, well-established Wall Street firms, these investments are not not only not encouraged, but they're not allowed. Um, and yet, people are doing it. And I think that we need to be able to guide them and and help them. Um, I I think that I. I think that the underlying technology behind cryptocurrency is not going anywhere. There are tremendous applications, and, um, and we need to be aware of it and on top of it to be able to advise our clients the best we can. Um, okay. oh, no, I, I agree with the, 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 the blockchain technology is going to re revolutionize, I think, the accounting industry in general. Um, just thinking about the broad aspect of having a company's general ledger on the blockchain and on many different computers and not able to change any entry in, into the general ledger which will highly reduce uh, fraud risk, uh, might reduce the amount of accountants needed on a job, but, um, or, or lawyers to say th for that. But, and another thing that I've been seeing in the industry is um, I have a, a lot of clients in the asset management industry, hedge funds, private equity, and I see the application of traders that have been investing in blockchain or, or uh, cryptocurrency or mining setting up these investment firms or these uh, investment vehicles to do mining, to do trading, because now they have all this wealth and they, ha they think they have this knowledge and they don't understand that, they're, that one, cryptocurrency is not re heavily regulated, but the aspect of money managing is heavily regulated in the United States. So they're, they're starting to see this mix of non-regulated trading industry with a regulated investment management type industry. So it's, there's a little bit of a clash and you know, accounting firms are, are still trying to figure out these days how to audit cryptocurrency funds from an investor base for SEC purposes. So it's, it's gonna be quite interesting, I think, over the next year. Yeah, my final thought was just, you know, Suzanne sort of alluded to it, but there are actually investment banks that will not take clients that hold cryptocurrency. There are law firms, I know for a fact, that have told their attorneys they cannot hold any crypto and should sell it. So I think it's really vital to find a team um, that you feel comfortable with that has experience and expertise, whether it's your law firm, your auditing firm, your accountants, your you know, investment bank, et cetera. It's, it's really key that your advisors understand the basics of what you're trying to do and accomplish. So uh, with that, I will open up the question. Yes, please, just speak yeah, up a little. Sure, this is, uh, I don't think it's a specific question, but for the 114 requirement for a quote humanity, um, how does that work? So like if a domestic LLC has a foreign exchange, 
requirement? <clears throat> Can the LLC do that directly, or is there certain information that flows up through a K-1 and then the members are responsible? Or is there some other way that's managed? The FinCEN 114 form? Yeah. So the entity is going to be the reporting entity that holds the value of that foreign financial account. Um, and then an entity can't, so there's two steps. There's the owner that has the value and then who has signature authority. So an entity can't have signature authority over its own account, so some individual has to have signature authority. So usually the individual will file for signature authority over the account and the entity will file for value. But if it's a, an LLC with many members, are you saying the manager, the, the LLC manager? The LLC will, will file one in its name and then anybody inside of that LLC whether it's an owner or a somebody in the C-suite or employee will have to file for signature authority as well too. Okay but if it's a passive member and, and their pro rata the, shares they have no Does not matter. I see. They just by owning the LLC they don't have most likely they won't have to file a FinCEN if they meet certain ownership thresholds of the LLC they might have an indirect ownership of that cash, it's like 50% or more. So you'd have to look at the ownership flow through of that LLC to see who might have to file individually. But most of the time that's not the case. It's usually an individual will so file for signature authority. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything done anything. No, that's not the same, yeah. Uh, Kent, one, one thing on the, the, the whole 114 thing. Remember, that's I think it's the highest balance on any given day. So you may have put some money in there and then it could have a spike. And so on that one day, maybe you're holding more than the, the threshold amount. Yeah, so you could, you know, you put a thousand dollar, a couple thousand dollars in, it could go up to eleven thousand on on one day, two days, and then drop back down and never really hit that because we had that last year when it hit nineteen or or whatever you're holding. Um, so you got to look back all these times. And it's a coming, sorry, it's a commingling of all of your foreign financial accounts, not just one individually. So if you have ten foreign financial accounts with a thousand dollars, you might have, you, you potentially could have a, a filing requirement. I don't understand the rationale why you would think you wouldn't have to file things so. It's uh, It could be one of two things, right? It could be either they don't believe they have that filing obligation or uh, they don't think they had the threshold. They don't think they have over $10,000. I mean, it's... Uh, another thing with that is, you know, you also have all these foreign exchanges that are closing and you don't have access to that information anymore. So I don't, I don't even know what I would report. Uh, also, the IRS has said that it's property, right? So it's a question as to whether or not it's a foreign financial account which triggers the obligation for FinCEN 114. So it's questionable. Uh, that's why, you know, we've been advising, you know, if there's nothing else that you're concerned about, then perhaps go ahead and make a disclosure. If there are things that you're concerned about, t talk to somebody. <laughs> So that's the topic of a whole other panel. Um, but, but I w and, and we have actually our most of our uh, breakfast uh, on, uh, videotape and on our website. But I will just give you a very brief answer. Um, my response is that um, token sales need to be thought through uh, well in advance of actually issuing the token. Um, I think a lot of people, especially my kind of anarchist friends, are um, a little surprised when I say that tokens are regulated, um, just like any other security. Um, at this point, notwithstanding what the SEC has said in the Dow report from last summer, uh, where just quickly, you know, it did say that in the case of the Dow, the Dow token was a security, but it is a very facts and circumstances based test under the Howey test, and they basically left the door open to a so-called utility token or non-security. The problem is, is that to date, the SEC has made it very clear that all of the token sales and ICOs that it's reviewed, again, not all token sales, but the ones that they've reviewed, have the so-called hallmarks of a security. So I would say, you know, generally speaking, if you're dealing with a token sale where you're raising capital in advance of the platform being functional, if you're raising capital and marketing in the US, you need to see a lawyer. Um, there, there's no way around it. I, I think at this point, just you know, some free thoughts, is it's nearly impossible to prove to the SEC that you have a utility token. Um, that may change. 
Uh, there are some interesting events happening in Wyoming. Uh, we had a speaker at our last panel named Caitlin Long, who's uh, uh, the co-founder of the Wyoming Blockchain Coalition, and, and I'm, I speak to them maybe twice a week. So um, again, that, that doesn't mean that that'll change anything on a federal level, because of course, forgive the term, but federal law trumps state law. Um, but um, it is interesting, and we'll see if you know the state uh, innovations will push the the the, uh, the federal the Congress meaning to innovate as well. But at the moment, um, yes, of course, there are ways to look. Being a security is not it's, it's not a four letter word, right? I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world to be a security. There are ways to. Um, for example, without calling your token a security, there are ways to comply so that if the law changes or if SEC comes after you, you could at least say, well, I, uh, assuming it was a security, I've been in compliance and done you know, A through Z. Um, and if it's not a security, then great, you're in compliance, so there's nothing to worry about. But for those who are thinking, no, there's no way my token is a security, there's no way. Good luck. I mean, uh, then you need a member of our blockchain task force to defend you when the SEC comes after you. So, yeah. and, and we okay. can introduce well, you to those folks. Just the one, one thing on that. So our, our practice is we really don't work with anyone unless they've gone through an, a lawyer first. And it, 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 there's a select account, uh, lawyers that we will work with, not just anybody. Um, so that's the first step that we do. And, and everybody thinks their token is utility and everyone's token is security. That's how we practice. Start with that <laughs> and then we, we go forward. But um, yeah, if you get a good legal team, they give you a good opinion. The earlier you start with your accountants, the better. Again, that's a plug for us, but the, we can help you a lot more before you do something. After you've done your ICO and you're like, hey, how do you save me some money? Uh, maybe I can cut your electric bill or something, but I can't really help you after that. So that's... Yeah. Any thoughts on the Tether subpoena? Tether is a whole other world. Um, we might have a panel just on Tether and some other class action lawsuits. Um, I think it's more of a, a business issue, actually. Like the underlying, let me take a step back. You know, a lot of the token sales are ultimately really just an idea and a team, right? Obviously, they're startups. They don't usually have an operating history. That's starting to change. We are seeing some more sophisticated um, companies get involved. But, but you know, for, I think the premise of Tether was interesting, right? Tying it to the dollar. Um, but it, in a way, sort of undermines the basic concept of cryptocurrencies. So, and we see the results. And, and it's not just Tether, right? It's, um, was it Tezos, the, uh, the Swiss uh, firm that's uh, being, the foundation, also class action lawsuits. I mean, um, again, I would just say, and similar to what um, Brian was saying, you know, for lawyers also, the better, the earlier on in the process that you get some legal advice, even if it's just to tell you, you know, it's not gonna work. Um, or just do uh, a token sale outside the U.S., um, the better it is for all the team members in the long run. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about coins that you receive in a fork, how they are to be treated? Coins that are forked? That, that you get from a fork. A fork occurs. I own Bitcoin and it's yeah. Bitcoin fork. I get a bunch of some other coin as a result of that. How should that be treated? Treated under for tax purposes? For tax purposes, like a dividend? I'll take it. Um, so here, here's our approach to a hard fork, right? So if there's a fork, um, you are entitled to those, uh, whatever the secondary uh, token is. Whether or not you take control of that or whether you actually have that, and again, that's a very fluid facts and circumstance thing, uh, it's not actually taxable until you, you take control of that and you have some dominion over that. Uh, that's the approach that we'll take. Just because it forks doesn't mean you instantly have a taxable event. But if I do take control of that... You have a taxable event. Now, the value of what your taxable event is, is, uh, again, I don't believe it's a stock split, um, but it, it's, there's some value ascribed to it. And whether they would say, you know, if it trades, it's a dollar on day one, and it goes to $20 on day two. Did you get something worth a dollar or $20? You know, 7% just because it forks... Uh, Again, again, are you conservative or are you not? That's the uh, approach. Yeah, did you t when did you take the control over that, that fork? Was it a month, two months, six months later, and the values increased? Like, I'll take control over that now because it's, the values increased. Well, you could theoretically look at that date that you assumed you wanted to assume value, and that could be the taxable base. You pay tax on that, becomes your, your cost basis. 
and then whatever that is capital afterwards. But it, it, it's again all facts and circumstances uh, amongst the transaction, your your individual transaction. All right, two last questions, uh, Rita. Uh, the taxable event only wants to liquidate it. Is that correct? No. 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 So if you. Because you're you're in you're in receipt of that, so it would be you Not know. Not the think, fork. Think, you're talking about the fork or just generally? Well, generally speaking, it's a taxable. Just, so even well, this is a tricky one because this is when you receive, uh, right? But if if you, for instance, I have a friend of mine who just happened to make millions of dollars in the past year, and he claims uh, this is just an example. He says, "Well, I've never sold a single." coin for fiat because he's been flipping it, right? So so what do you do in that instance? So how do, how do you treat that? Uh, that's that goes an, back that goes that's back an to the change. If he's gone from one coin to another the IRS views that as a disposition or exchange. That's like, you know, uh, if, if I own this chair and I exchange it for something else, I've actually made an exchange for value and I'm taxable on that extra asset that I receive. Oh God, that's a nightmare. But yes. <laughs> what, what, I would, what I would tell your friend is Google 2014-21. It's about a 10-page document published by the IRS. And it, it should give him a little bit of insight as to, you know, how the IRS views these types of transactions. And, it's, and then come see because <laughs> it's it's absolutely it's, it's absolutely a taxable event. Now the question is, can we somehow qualify for not recognition under 1031? We have differing opinions on that. It's case by case. Maybe the answer is maybe. It's not a definite yes. Not a definite no. And then you got to have records. And I sure hope that your friend has all these records so we can analyze to see what we even have options well, it's for. Well, the CSV files, right, that you download. Those are all your only records. But what's interesting, and I know Richard, you have a question too, but um, I, I was just doing some research and digging around, and there are some sites that help you generate a, I forget the, the uh, number of the, of the form, um, and it's interesting, they give you the, all these options, you know, first in, first out, last in, first out, and so, so you, it basically gives you the option to choose what, you know, what gives you the most, right? Well, you're, you're at that point, you're establishing a method of taxation. So you can't pick and choose. You, once you pick this overall method, you are pretty much locked in for a while, for, for almost ever, unless you apply for a change in account. You have three options, right? There's LIFO, FIFO, specific. and specified transactions. So, and like he's saying, you're... You can't, that's not, no, no you can't use that. <laughs> this is a legitimate, although the, the web, I forget the name of the website. And, wait, wait, wait yeah. just one, one, one comment on that though. Yeah. With, with these websites, you're going to put in like, I think you put in your public key or you put in some information no, 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 or no. Okay. whatever they're doing. But again, they do have limitations because we're actually working with software developers who are not one of these websites. They're actually developing whole company, big company. They are having trouble going to some of these exchanges, some of these places, and getting your information, you know, Ether Delta, where maybe there's not exactly things. There's, they're not getting all of that information. So it is always relying, uh, the responsibility of the taxpayer to do everything. So you can't just put it into a website, crank it out, and go, hey, there's my gain. It, it may have missed something, it may have not. So be careful with those websites. You have, um, yeah. you have to match, so again, one of my clients is using <clears throat> one of these said websites, and <clears throat> sorry, and I'm going to have to, he's exporting every CSV file, uh -huh. and then I'm reviewing that CSV file to his, at, through his public key linking, or the API link through, through that exchange, and I'm reviewing every transaction from cash out of his US bank account to buying his first Bitcoin, to going to that Bitcoin to wherever it went afterwards, and just reviewing everything. It's very time consuming, but, you know, to put it, it's it's a lot of time, and if if you don't have the records, it can be very hard to calculate a gain. But eventually, do have you heard of any exchanges setting up eventually practices to provide those forms to their Coinbase has this thing called gain and loss reporter or something. It is just utter. It, no, everybody has access to that report, I believe, but it's not. I would not rely on it at all. Okay. I've seen I've seen it. A little bit. Richie, last question. Oh, I wanted to follow up on the question on a tax basis in regards to a port. So, if uh, you own Bitcoin and forks into AK, whatever other, <coughs> other thing, are you paying taxes 
on that as of the day of as of the day of the fork. So you have to go make it's like an ordinary income paid on the on the on the, on the fork currency, or is it add to the collective tax base? So you actually sell. Uh, our approach has been so if you when it, when it forks, the conservative thing is you you pick it up in income on the first day. That, that's what we usually tell people because, again, like Chris was saying, it's probably going to go up in value. So if it's five dollars now, you don't want to pick up an income when it's five hundred dollars. So you pick it up that day. I don't believe that you treat it like a stock split where if I have a thousand dollars worth of it, I then spread my basis between the two of them and then wait until I sell it to do that. It's you receive something of value that you can go out and sell right then. So that's an income event for you. Do, you, do my question I always ask taxpayers: Do you feel richer after the fork? I don't know, some of them are worthless. <laughs> so, is it better, you say some of them are worthless, okay, let's say you receive, let's say you assign a value of two cents to a lot of these tokens, yeah. and you, if you pick that up into income in that year, and say you hold on to them for five years, and then in year six, it just magically jumps up in value, right, to, let's say a million dollars. If you didn't recognize income in that first year, that million dollars is now ordinary income. If you sign a value at that date of receipt that you have dominion or control over, at say five dollars, you've picked up income, you've established a, a basis, and then after that, it's capital. So you can achieve long-term. You could achieve long-term capital gain status at a lower tax rate. So you got to understand when you receive it, dominion control, assign a value. If you can't assign a value, get a valuation done on that particular currency. Hire somebody to do a third-party valuation. Um, go to an exchange, get some documentation. There's a lot of things that can be done to help structure that fork in a best in a tax-efficient way. If, I, I would want to follow up. If, it, if all of these points, cryptocurrencies are securities, wouldn't they not qualify as a stock split? They're not securities for the IRS. They're defined as property. Okay. And what's interesting yeah. to note is when the SEC was um, uh, giving testimony in Congress uh, and they talked to FinCEN, I mean, there were, the CFTC rather, there was no one from IRS. There was no interest in speaking to the IRS, which I find interesting. Yeah. I mean, they've got to be part of the dialogue. I think well, they issued that notice and they're, they're like, <laughs> we have other things to worry about right now. Yeah. Well, they, they have no time, no resources, or capable people, that's a different thing. Um, but again, so so far, as long as we've been doing this, I would say 90 to 95 percent of the rules that we need to do our job are already written. They were written in the 60s and the 70s, and they have examples from the 70s, but they're all out there. And remember, the IRS has three years to, uh, to audit you, or if they believe you committed fraud, they have forever. So they don't have to come out, they don't have to say anything, they've said everything they want to say, the rules are out there, so comply or don't. But and they're, they're not nice either, so. We're, we're, I mean, I, we're relying for tax on a lot of old, old case law. And it's, go, going back before, I was even born. So it's, it's, it's interesting to go back that far. What was the result? 2014-21. All right, thanks very much, everyone, for coming out to our panel. Please stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions.